brutality, my diamonds that cold. Versace chunks, I hit my backstroke. Knock on the door. She had the back, bro. Welcome back to Houdini is hip. In this part, we're finally getting into the fun stuff. In the last few parts, we looked at rendering and all of the basics, but in this part, we're finally going to start on simulations and dynamics. So all of the following parts from here on out, we're going to be looking at the different types of dynamics and the different types of simulations, starting with the most basic. In this part, we're looking at pop networks. So what is a pop net? Well, a pop net is a particle operator network, right? Shortened as pop net. You'll often hear things like SOPs, DOPs, and that's just different shorthand phrases used inside of Udine. For example, SOPs are just surface operators, and those are things like geometry. So if you're just working with static geometry, you're working at the SOP level. If you're working at a dynamic level, you're going to be working with dynamic operators or DOPs. So we're going to be working with POPs, particle operators. Now, particles are the most basic type of simulation that you can do inside of Houdini because all they are are a bunch of points being driven by a bunch of rules. So we don't have to, fortunately, figure out all of those rules for ourselves. We just use a bunch of different nodes to define how particles move and interact and all of those things. So what we're going to be doing is creating a spark system. So we're just going to have some sparks falling onto a surface and we're going to have them sort of breaking up and jumping about. So let's get straight into it, into Houdini. So inside of Houdini, we've got a fresh file. We're not doing anything with the donut anymore. We're going to go straight into a brand new thing. So let's go ahead and tab in a geometry node. This is just our starting point. And we're going to call this sparks. Inside of here, we're going to create a grid. So just tab in a grid node. And right over here, we just have this 10 by 10 grid. So this is 10 meters by 10 meters. If we're looking at the size of our particles, they're going to be tiny, right? Sparks are really, really small. So 10 is going to be a bit big. We're going to be using this as an emitter. So if you imagine this grid and particles are just falling off of it, that's our emitter, right? An emitter is just something that emits particles. So that can be any sort of shape, any sort of object. It can be a volume. There's plenty of things that it can be. But in this case, we're just going to use a grid. So we're going to scale this grid down just to a one by one, and then we're going to move it up. So we're going to move it up by 1.5 meters. So it's 1.5 meters above the ground. Next, we're going to animate it. And this is something that we haven't yet done. And this is going to be our first look at our timeline. And our timeline is going to be important again later when we look at actual simulations. So for now, we're going to animate. So if we drag along our timeline, nothing happens, right? Everything is static. But let's go ahead and switch on our transform handles. And let's adjust some settings over here. So the first thing that I'm going to do is on frame one, I'm going to set a keyframe. Now, if you're not familiar with animation, a keyframe is just a set point of data. If we have position A over here at frame one and position B over here at frame 24, then in between, there'll be an interpolation or a movement from position A to position B. So each keyframe holds a data point and in between, we interpolate between that. So that's how you get animation. And so we're going to do a super basic animation. We're just going to keyframe the first frame. So to do that, we're going to hold Alt, and then we're going to click on the parameter. So the parameter that we want to change is the center. As you'll see, when you do that, they go green, right? All of these over here, these parameters turn green. That means that we have a keyframe at this current frame. When we move away from frame one, you'll notice that it's now just this blue color. That means that it's keyframed, so this animation, but it doesn't have a keyframe at the current frame because now we're on frame like 49, there's no animation there. So we're going to go over to frame 96 and then we're just going to move our grid over. So we're going to move it along the X axis. So we'll just move it over here and we'll move it over to about three. So we'll just set that to three. Now you'll see that it is currently yellow. That means that there's been a change made but we haven't keyframed it. So to keyframe it once again, hold Alt, click on the parameter name. And you can also keyframe a single parameter. You don't have to keyframe all three of them. I'm just doing it like that because it's easy, but you don't have to do it that way. So there we go. If we now go to the start and we drag along, you'll see that our grid moves. If we play this back, it'll move really quickly over, right? And that's because by default, Houdini plays back our timeline as fast as it possibly can. But if you wanted to play back at real time, you can activate the real time toggle. Now, when I say real time, what I mean is play it back at the actual specified frame rate. So we have 96 frames. Now in Houdini, 24 frames per second is the default. So every 24 frames represents one second. So as you can see over here, we have one to 24, that's one second. 
24 to 48, two seconds, 48 to 72, three seconds, 72 to 96, four seconds. So that's technically how long it should take to play it back. And if we activate our real time toggle in the bottom left, that's exactly what will happen. It'll take four seconds to go from frame one to 96. Perfect. We've got our grid and it's moving, it's animated, and we've activated our real time toggle. From here, we can go ahead and create a pop network. We're going to press tab and type pop, right? Over there, you'll see pop network, press enter and drop it over here. Now, you'll notice that there are four inputs for this pop network. So we're just going to use the first input for this. So go ahead and plug the grid into your first input for your pop network. And what you'll notice immediately once you set your display flag on your pop network is that we now have a bunch of points where our grid once was. And if we play this back, you'll notice something a bit strange. So we play this back and over time, we end up with a bunch of points as our grid moves by, right? Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to template our grid. So templating is a way of viewing another node that we aren't currently using. It's useful for comparing things. So what we can do over here is next to our display flag on our grid, we have the template option, just template. And what you'll see is this outline for our grid. And we can now see that as our grid moves along, that's actually what's leaving behind our points, right? It's an emitter. However, our points aren't doing anything. These are our particles, but they're not doing anything just yet. The reason is we haven't told them what to do. We haven't given them gravity or wind or any sort of forces. We haven't let them interact with any objects, none of that. So we're going to go inside of our pop network to define all of that. Double click on the pop network. And at this level, you are now at the dynamics level. And this isn't specific to a pop network. In the top right, you'll see it says dynamics. And this is how it'll be in every dynamics network, whether you're working with pops, vellum, flip, RBD, pyro, it'll all be in the same network. It'll all be in a dynamics network. And in this case, we're just working with particles. So it's called a pop net, but really it's just a dot net. It's a dynamics network. So over here, we have a couple of things. On the left-hand side, we have the pop object. On the right-hand side, we have our source. And in the middle, we have our solver. And at the bottom, we have an output. So I'm going to bring this up full screen. You can press Control plus B to maximize a particular window. So hover over a window, Control B, maximize it. So let me just explain what's going on here, because this is what you're going to see every time you use a dynamics network. What you have on the left-hand side is a pop object or any sort of object. This can be a flip object, a smoke object, anything. What that does is it stores the data for your simulation. So when you're exporting this or using it later on, you're actually using the pop object, right? You're taking the data from the pop object and that's what you're using. On the right-hand side, we have our source. This is always gonna be the situation where you have the pop object on the left, source on the right. Source is just whatever you're bringing into the simulation. So you're bringing in some new data and you're feeding it into that pop object, right? So you have new information being brought in for every frame or whenever you need it. Then both of those plug into a solver. So we have an object, we have a source, and we have a solver. The solver is like the brains behind it, right? It's what actually does the work. So we're bringing in some information, we're solving it in the solver, and we're feeding that new information into the object to be stored. So the object has our information, the solver runs over the information every frame, and we're just sourcing new things in. And then it gets output. And technically we're outputting the pop object, the solver has just done some operations on it. And this actually makes a lot of sense because a lot of the time when we have a multi-input node, the output is generally what the first input was. And it's exactly that over here. The pop object is what's getting output, which is using the solver to iterate on it and make changes. So we can go ahead and also drop other nodes, right? So we can add more sources or we can add forces underneath the solver. Let's go ahead and add a gravity force. So over here, we'll plug the gravity force under our pop solver, just like that. So now we have our first force that we want to affect our particles with. I'm going to press Control B to minimize this again. And if we now play this back, you'll notice that we have particles that fall over time. We now have gravity. And this is useful for plenty of things, right? And in this case, we already have something that potentially looks like rain or something like that. What you will notice is when we play it back, we have this blue bar that occurs at the bottom in our timeline. And this blue bar is what is cached. So when I say cached, it's what's already been calculated and stored to the memory of your computer, to the RAM. And you can define how big your cache size is under the cache tab of the DOP network. But so this tells you, okay, I've already calculated this many frames. We can play this back freely, right? 
Now, this isn't something that's necessarily important when you're working with a small pop network like this, but when you're working with a flip simulation that takes maybe a couple of minutes per frame, then this is important, right? Because when things get cached to disk, you can play them back. You don't have to recalculate them. So let's go back inside of our popnet and make some changes. Inside of here, let's add a collider. So we're going to add a ground plane. So just type ground and you can drop a ground plane. We'll drop it over to the left over here and we'll be merging it in. So we'll drop a merge node and after our gravity, we'll just plug this merge node and then we'll plug our ground plane into the merge node. Now, what you'll notice on the merge node is that there's a relationship of collide relationship and the effector relationship is left affects right. So that means that the left input of the merge node affects the right input. We want the ground plane to affect the particles. So what we're going to do is we're going to swap them around by clicking on these little arrows. So we click on the arrow and it swaps the inputs around. Alternatively, you could just use mutual, which is fine, but I find it looks neater if you just have your colliders on the left-hand side. So just make sure that your collider is coming into the left input. Now, what that will do is it'll add a ground plane to our simulation and our particles can now collide with that ground plane. If we look at our timeline, however, you'll notice that our timeline is now orange. That means that there has been some changes made and what's been cached is no longer relevant. It's no longer correct. It doesn't reflect the most current change. So because we added a ground plane, this cache is no longer relevant. So we can jump back to the start. We can press these double arrows on the left-hand side, jump back to the start, and you'll notice a ground plane. The ground plane has some settings for its position and things, but we're just gonna leave it as it is. And we can now play this back again. What you'll notice is that the particles now hit the ground, they bounce a little, and then they come to rest. Right. Now, the thing about particles like this is that they don't really have any sort of variation to them. They're just falling straight down, they're bouncing once or twice, and then coming to rest. They don't roll or anything like that because they're just points. There's nothing defining any sort of particular movement to them. They just have a velocity, and that velocity stops. Right. So let's make some changes to improve this. Firstly, our particles are falling in these sheets. The reason that happens is because we have particles being emitted too quickly. If we go to frame one, right? And then if we press the arrow key, so just right arrow key once, you'll notice that we have a new set of particles. If we go again and again and again and again, you'll notice that particles are being emitted, but the amount of distance that they're covering between two frames is too big. So what you end up with is a gap between them, right? So at frame one, they're over here, based on their velocity at frame two, they're over here. However, that's a big gap, right? So there's no information in between there. So what we can actually do is go to our pop source and on here we can change some settings, right? We can tell it that we don't want it to emit this way, we want it to jitter the emission. So we can go over to the birth tab of this and at the bottom over here we have the jitter birth time. And we're going to set this to negative. If you hover over it, it'll explain what it is. And you'll see that the last sentence is, this is useful when adding high velocity particles from emitters as it won't generate clumps on each frame. That's exactly what ours is doing. Jump back to the start, play it back. That's one problem fixed. So the other thing is our particles are just falling, right? Because we have gravity and the gravity is just pulling them straight down. That's all that's happening to them. However, if we go over to the attributes tab over here, you'll see that we have this option to inherit velocity. Now that's useful if our grid has some sort of velocity. If we generate velocity on it and we have our grid moving, then the points will carry that velocity with them. However, we can also add to an inherited velocity or set its initial velocity. We're going to set the initial velocity. And if we set it to a variance of one, so that's one on every axis, it'll give it some random velocity as it's born. So if we play that back, you'll see that it's now a bit more spread out, right? It's not so uniform. There's a bit of variation to it. So cool, we have that. Next, we wanted to actually hit the ground plane and do something. So we need a collision behavior. We wanted to hit the ground plane and then emit some more sparks, right? So it's almost like it's hitting and then breaking up into smaller sparks. So to do that, we're going to go ahead and drop a pop collision behavior, pop collision behavior. And this goes over here by our sources. So if this doesn't seem to make sense to you at the moment, how we have it is our pop object is just storing the data. So we never really add anything to this left side. The right side is our source. So we wanna add things that affect our source, right? We wanna add behaviors and all sorts of things that actually affect our source. Then we can tell our solver to actually do the work with this information that we're giving it. So now what this pop collision behavior does is it tracks when something collides. So as you can see, these points turn red when they collide with the ground. So what this allows us to do is it allows us to use that detection of collision to run some other things. 
So once it's collided, what do we want to do? We want to emit sparks. So first thing that we're going to do is add these to a group, right? And we can name this group whatever we want. I'll just call it impact. So that's a group called impact. We haven't looked at groups in Houdini just yet, but a group is exactly what it sounds like. If we have a bunch of points, some of them can be added to a group so that they're easy to recall. Let's say you have a thousand points and you group a hundred of them, right? You can then individually work on that single group. You can take those hundred points and you can change their color, you can change their size, you can do whatever you want with them, right? As long as they're in a group, they're really easy to reference. So that's why groups are useful. So we're going to have this group name impact. If we jump up a level and we middle mouse on our popnet as this plays back, we'll be able to see that at the bottom over here, we have two point groups. We have impact and we have stream source first input. Um, for now, you can ignore all those other attributes. Those are all generated by our solver. So those are things like the age of the particle, color, whether it's alive or dead, its velocity, all of those things. So we don't need to worry about that right now. We're just looking at the groups. So we have impact and we have stream source first input. Stream source first input is auto-generated by the Pop Network. If we go back inside, it's this over here, right? Source first input, and it's coming from the stream. So that just means that any particles coming in here, those are part of source first input. So back to our collision stuff. What we want is for these points to die on collision. So as they collide, they die. If we do that, you'll see that those points just disappear. As they collide, they just disappear. Now, why do we want that? Well, what we can do is, as those points collide, they'll get added to a group. And then what we can do is we can take that group and we can emit some new points from that position. So as if it's hitting and then exploding, and then it'll kill the point, right? So what we can do is we can very easily add a pop replicate node. And this is a node used for generating more points from a source of points. So over here, we can plug this into second input and we're gonna have to change a couple of things. So firstly, constant birth rate, we don't want that, right? Constant birth rate just refers to how many points are emitted per second. So we're going to switch that to zero. And you can also switch the constant activation to zero. The impulse count is how many points are generated when this node is run. So what we're going to do is we're going to set this impulse count to five. And we're also going to change the group. We're going to say we only want the group impact, right? We only want impact to replicate points. The other thing that we're going to do is we're going to go over to this shape over here. And the shape that we want to emit from is a single point. So what this means is when this point impacts and as part of a group, emit points in a sphere. We don't want that. We want it to emit from a single point at that impact point. So we're just going to set this to point just like that. All right, so once we have that, if we play it back, you would assume that this would work, right? So you play it back and what we're expecting is for a point to hit the ground and then basically explode into some more points. So we play this back and that doesn't happen. The reason is that the order of these are important. Right. The way this works is your source first input comes in and then it tries to merge in the pop replicate. But this group is only made after the pop replicate is merged in. So what we actually need is for this collision behavior to be detected before we merge in the pop replicate. So all we have to do is bring the pop collision behavior above this before we merge in the pop replicate. So we can just click on this and you can actually wiggle nodes around. You can wiggle it like that to release it. And we can drag it over here plug it in there. Okay, so if we try this now, let's see what we have. Okay, so that works, right? What's happening is our points are coming in, they collide with the ground. When they collide with the ground, we create some replicas of them. That's why they're actually coming through as red, right? These aren't those same points that you were seeing before. What they're doing is they're actually fetching the attributes of the point that's colliding with the ground. So remember, the point collides with the ground, turns red, dies. Then we replicate points from that and they pick up all of the attributes of that point. We can actually see this. If we go over to our pop replicate node under the attributes, we can see that we're inheriting all attributes. That means that we're inheriting velocity, color, scale, all of those things. So we can actually tell it that we don't want to inherit color and all of that. We just want to inherit V for velocity, right? So V is our velocity attribute. That's all we want to inherit. And we can add some variance to this. We can say add to inherited velocity and we have some variance over there. And if we go back and play this again, you'll notice that we have that. So these points are now kind of exploding as they hit the ground. Cool. So we don't want these points to last for very long. Once a point impacts, we want those points to shoot out, but then we want them to die off very quickly, right? As if it were a spark. So what we can do is on our pop replicate node, go over to the birth tab and under life expectancy, we have this that says 100. 
that means 100 seconds. So remember, as we said before, 24 frames equals one second. So that means 100 times 24, so 2,400. We can change this to a tiny value, like 0 0.1. And if we play this back now, you'll notice that these points don't live for very long once they've been replicated, right? And we can mess around with different values for this, 0 0.2. That looks pretty cool. What you can do with that is you can change the life variance. So life variance, it'll take your life expectancy of 0.2 seconds and add a bit of variation to it. So each point will vary slightly. So it's just for randomization. So we can add 0.1 to that and some will last longer than others. Okay, so let's also just add a group node. Let's go ahead and group this. So a pop group and over here, we'll just say enable, right? All we're gonna do is just enable and add a group name. So the group for this can be something like splash. I don't know, it's just the points that splash. And yeah, so everything coming from that stream over there is going to be grouped into splash. So they're not gonna be affected by anything on the side. They're only going to be affected by things on the side, right? So if we go up a level and we play this back, what we can actually do is we can now use those groups that we created. So for example, I can drop a color node and over here, we can just target the splash group and we can make them red, right? Or orange or whatever, just so that we can see that they're a different group. Cool. So we have some particles over there. So that's all we're really going to do in terms of the actual particle stuff. The next thing that we're going to do is we're going to work with a little bit of VEX code. And the reason we're going to be working with some code is because we need to affect our attributes. So we're going to be using some things to change our attributes. We're going to be doing things to scale the particles and all of that. So Let's go ahead and try that. Let's go ahead and drop an attribute wrangle. You can type AW for short. And over here, we're just going to plug our pop network into this attribute wrangle. The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to set a P scale. Now, P scale is the size of the particle. Now, at the moment, all of these are just points, right? But when we render points, points are rendered as spheres. And those spheres have their size defined by P scale. So if you render a particle with a P scale of one, it'll render as a sphere with a diameter of one. So what we can do is we can control that P scale and have this vary the sizes of our spheres, right? Now, if you haven't worked with VEX before, this might seem a little bit strange, but just bear with me. I'll try to explain this as best as I can. Firstly, we're going to need to create an attribute. So to create an attribute in VEX, you just say at, and that creates an attribute, and then you give it a name. So we're going to say at P scale. Right, so we've created an attribute called at p scale, and we need to make it equal to something. So we say equals, and let's make it equal to 0 0.1. Now, with vex, we have something called syntax, and syntax is basically the grammar of coding. And so we have at p scale equals 0 0.1, and to tell it that we've ended that line, we put a semicolon. That's almost like a full stop, right? So if you are writing an English sentence, that's like a full stop. If you click away, you won't see anything change, but if you middle mouse on this attribute wrangle, and you go through all of these attributes, you'll see that over there we have P scale. And if we go over to our geometry spreadsheet, which is where we look at our attributes, we can go ahead and find our P scale over here. If we type P scale in the attribute section, we can see that all of our points, so on the left, these are point numbers, all of our points have a P scale of 0 0.1. So all of these points that you're seeing have a P scale of 0 0.1 because we've told it run over points, make P scale equal to 0 0.1. Okay, if we want to view our P scale, what can we do? There's a really nice thing that we can do inside of our viewport. If we hover on our viewport and just press D, that'll bring up these extended display options that we looked at very briefly before. But if we go over to our geometry and we go down to particles, we can say display particles as, and they're currently displayed as points, but we can set them to be displayed as lit spheres. Lit spheres will change them all to their correct P scale, right? So this is what they'll render as actually. And at the moment, they're kind of chunky, but that's what they'll render as. All right, so from here, I'm not going to make any more changes right now. What I want to do is I want to go over to the stage level as we looked at in the last part and set up a bit of a render. And so that we can actually see what this looks like and we can come back and forth and kind of make changes and figure out how we want it to look. Before we do that, if you found this video useful so far or this entire series useful, please remember to leave a like and subscribe if you want. And if you really like this video, feel free to hit the join button and become a member. It really does help us out. So, okay, straight back into it. Let's go over to the stage level. Over there, object network, we'll use the drop down, go to stage. 
Over here, we'll use a self import. With this, we'll import our Sparks node. And just like that, we have these points being brought in over here. Now, what you'll notice is that it's also bringing in our ground plane, and that's not actually what we want. If we go back over to our object level and to our Sparks, the reason it's doing that is because over here in our PopNet, what it's doing is it's outputting everything that's in the network, right? So ground plane plus particles, all of it. We only want our particles. So to do that, we can just call the name of the pop object, right? Because at the moment, it's bringing in the ground plane and the pop object. We just want the pop object. So instead of saying asterisk, which is the same as everything, that's what it means. It's saying everything in the network. We can change this to pop object. Alternatively, you can use the drop down, and you have pop object or ground plane. So you can choose pop object, just like that. And we'll just bring that in. Cool. Back to our stage. We have just our particles being brought in. And you'll notice that at this level, they're just being displayed as points, right? Again, they're not being displayed as those full-size particles. What we can do is switch it to lit spheres, but I'm going to leave it as points just so that you remain aware that they are still technically just points, right? Only when we render do they actually become rendered as spheres. So over here, we can go ahead and switch on the comma render view. And this is actually what our render looks like. If we had to render this out to disk now, this is what we would have, just like that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to drop a camera node just over here, plug it in so we have our soft import and we have our camera plugged into it. What we're going to do is we're going to adjust the position of this camera so that it's looking at the particles as it's coming to the camera. So if we go back to the first frame, we want our camera kind of pointing towards the particles. So we're going to place it over here. We're going to move our focus over here. And so the settings that you're looking for is something like this. So a rotation of 90, 90, and 90 on every axis. And we can move this a little bit closer to our particles to see. Yeah, that should be cool. We'll translate it up very slightly, maybe 0.1 or 0.2, something like that. And let's take a look through our camera. Okay, something like that is kind of cool. I'll move it a bit further back so that it ends over here. All right. So once we have that, we can go ahead and drop a Karma render node. So we drop a Karma node right over here, plug the camera into the Karma render settings node. And we looked at this in the last part. This just sets up our render node. So it's the same as having a Karma render node at the out level. We're just creating it ourselves over here. If we now look through our camera and we set our display flag on our Karma render settings and then switch to the Karma render view, you'll notice that we have these particles <laughs> over here. And they look very weird, but you know, it's fine. So cool, we have these particles that are massive and they're just falling at our camera. We're going to go back up to the object level and make some changes. So we now know what this is going to look like when we try and render it out. So we can change the scale. Let's drop this P scale down to a lower value, 0.01. Okay, that looks better. However, they're all the same size. What happens if we want to add some randomization, right? So what we can do is we can use a function. When we're using vex, functions are things that we can use to make our lives a lot simpler. They're little pieces of code that actually call upon a much greater set of code. For example, we can use a random function to generate a random value for us. And so we're going to do that. We're going to say that our p scale is equal to 0.01 multiplied by a random value. So we type rand, that's the name of the function, and then we open a set of brackets. Now, inside of a set of brackets go your arguments. Arguments are just the things that this expects. This random function expects a particular input. And you can check the documentation on this. Or if you space and backspace over here, it'll tell you exactly what it looks for. And it'll tell you what the function does and everything. It says it creates a random number between zero and one from a seed. And then it tells you what it needs, right? So all we have to do is give it some value. Like if I give this a value of two, that's a random seed. If I give it a value of five, that's a different random seed. And as you can see, it's now multiplying it by this random number that's being generated. So this is just a different seed each time, right? It's always giving us a different value. However, that's just a constant, right? Every point gets the same scale. What happens if we want to scale them uniquely? So each point has a different scale. To do that, we can generate a random value based on an attribute that's unique to each point. So which attribute would that be? Fortunately, the pop network creates an attribute called ID. Now the ID attribute is an attribute that is unique per point, and it's used to track points over time. Because if you think about it, if you have a simulation where particles are being added and they're dying, all of the point numbers are changing. It becomes really difficult to track which point is which, because as time progresses, 
and you have more points being added or removed, all of your point numbers adjust. So what we have is a unique identifier called ID that stays the same no matter where the points are removed or added, right? They have a unique ID that stays the same. To use that ID, we just say at ID. Now you'll notice that it's the same as when we created at pscale. The thing about vex is that if an attribute exists, it'll call it. And if it doesn't exist, it'll create it. So at pscale didn't exist, so we created it. But at ID exists, so we're calling it. So we're just saying at pscale equals 0 0.01 times random. And the thing that we're feeding into that random function is the ID of every point. So what you'll notice now is that each point is a different scale. We play this back and we just have a bunch of different scale points. The next thing that we can do is that we can scale down these points over here. So you know the points that are impacting and splashing? We can actually scale them down over time. So they hit and then they shoot off and over time they scale down, all right? So we're going to add another attribute wrangle after this one. So we can go over here to the group and we can call splash. Remember, splash is just that group of points that are splashing off the surface. And I can show you which ones these are if I just set the CD attribute to some value, right? Those are the points. So those splash points, we wanna scale them down over time. To do that, I'm going to add a line of code and you can ignore that color thing. It's just for visualization purposes for now. What we're going to do is we're going to say at pscale, and this time we're not going to set it, right? Last time we set it, we said it's equal to 0 0.01 times some random value. This time we're going to multiply it by some value. So we're going to say is equal to at pscale times a particular value. Now, the attribute that we want to use is an attribute generated again by the pop network. It's called n age. n age defines how far along a particle is in its lifespan. So it starts at zero and it goes towards one. So as a particle is born, it'll be at zero. And as it progresses and reaches its end, so its death, it'll reach one. So zero to one, right, depending on its age. So what we can do is we can multiply our p-scale by that n age attribute. So if we multiply by at n age, you'll notice that these particles get smaller. However, they're not actually correct. What we want is one minus n age, because what we're currently doing is we're saying, okay, multiply p-scale, but by NH. But remember, NH is smallest when a particle is born. We want the reverse. So all we have to do is put this into brackets over here. And we can say 1 minus NH, right? So now we're saying the inverse. And if we play that back, you'll notice that our particles are now shrinking over time. And if you want, you can reduce the number of particles that you have, just so that it's easier to see what's going on. Again, we'll be going to the source first input. Under the birth tab, you'll have your constant birth rate. We can change this to just something like 500. So we'll only have a tenth of the amount that we used to have. And you just have something like that. And if you want, you can increase the life expectancy of those points. So the pop replicate points go over to that tab. Let's increase it to 0 0.5, something like that. And that looks much nicer. Cool. So that's looking good. If we now go over to our stage level, what you'll notice is we have these points and they're green, we can just ignore that for now. We haven't given it a material or anything. That's just kind of how they are. So we have these points that are just falling and kind of exploding off the ground. So that's cool. However, we want some other things. We want a color on these points. We want velocity, so we have motion blur. And then we wanna give them some sort of emission brightness. So let's do that. Let's first start with giving them a color. So in this attribute wrangle over here, the first one that we have, I'm going to add another line to this. Over here, we're going to say V at CD. Notice that it's a lowercase V and a capital C. Remember, CD is our color attribute. What we're saying here is V at CD. We're defining what type of data CD should hold, right? And we know it's a vector because a vector is anything that's multi-component. So something like position, right? So you'd have V at P, because position has three components, X, Y, and Z. CD has three components, R, G, and B, right? Red, green, blue. So V at CD. Then we make it equal to CH ramp. CH ramp is a channel ramp. What we can do with that is we can create a ramp or a curve or whatever we want, and that will define the distribution of color. It'll make sense when I kind of create it shortly. Just for now, understand that CH ramp creates a parameter for us. So let's go ahead and open brackets for this because it is a function. You'll notice that all of your functions 
are in this kind of turquoise color. Once you open your bracket, it will tell you what you need. So evaluates around parameter and returns its value. The first thing that we need is the string channel. So a string is just held within two inverted commas. So over here, all we're going to do is give it a name. We can call this color underscore ramp, something like that. After the inverted commas, we're just going to add a comma and then tell it what to be driven by. We're going to be driving it by its age. So we're going to say at an age, close brackets. And then we can add a semicolon because that's like a full stop, done. What you'll notice now is that all of your points are black, right? There's nothing really going on here. And that's because we're setting v at cd to this channel ramp function that hasn't actually been set up yet. To set up our channel ramp, we can go over to the right over here, create spare parameters for each unique call of ch. What that'll do is it'll create this parameter at the bottom of our attribute wrangle. It's a custom parameter that we've created, right? This isn't something that was on the attribute wrangle. We're actually creating it by using this channel ramp. And this is kind of cool because you can actually create a bunch of different things. You can have float ramps. So I'm just going to show you that quick. Float f equals chf. And this is the common thing, right? It'll always be ch something. So chf for a float. And we can just call it something like float, close brackets. And if we look at the bottom here, there's nothing there. But if we click on create spare parameters over here, it'll add one to the bottom. And we have this float. It doesn't do anything right now. But that's just useful to know, right? OK, so let's actually use this ramp now. At the moment, it's just a spline ramp. Now, a spline ramp is just 0 to 1, right? That's all it does. So it's not very useful for vectors. Vectors are generally represented by colors. So what we can do is we can actually change how this ramp works. If we go up to the top right of this attribute wrangle, you'll notice this cog over here. This cog exists for every node, right? We can click on like the pop net, you'll see it up there. You can click on this grid, you'll see it up there. It just defines kind of how this node functions. So this attribute wrangle, we can click over here and we can go edit parameter interface. Over here, you'll see that these are all of the different things on our attribute wrangle. And we can minimize these because, you know, it makes it seem a bit intimidating like that. But this is really all it is, right? There's some stuff. And then we have this color ramp. This is the ramp that we created. And if we go over to the right hand side, we can set the ramp type to color. If we apply and accept, it'll turn it from a spline ramp into a color ramp. The cool thing is this ramp over here now has some presets, right? So we can change colors ourselves. If we just set it to red or whatever, you can see that those points are red initially. Over here, if you set it to like blue, right? This ramp now represents a vector in the form of colors. I'm just going to remove this visualization over here. Right, so now we can see what we're working with. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm not going to use this ramp as it is. I'm going to click on this cog over here. These are presets. So we can set this to whatever we want, right? Something like Inferno or black body. I think we'll use black body. And then we'll flip it. Flip it the other way around. So what that does is that particles start out white. And as they age over time, they move towards the other end of the ramp. The way that a ramp works is we have all of these values set up on the ramp, but the actual value that it pulls and uses is based on this n age attribute, right? So this is actually the driving value. Now, remember we said that n age ranges from zero to one as a particle ages. So a particle will be white at first because that is zero. So when n age is zero, we're at the start of our ramp. When n age is one, we're at the end of our ramp. So as a particle ages, it moves over to that end over there. So a particle start white and end black. We can drag this over and adjust our colors just to make it more interesting. Something like that. Okay, so if we take a look at this now, you'll notice that all of our particles start out white and they hit the ground and they splash. And when they splash, they have these different colors. Okay, so let's go ahead and add a null over here. And let's just call this particles out. Now we have our color. However, we still want motion blur. And motion blur is actually something that's very easy to set up. As long as you have a velocity attribute, you can use it to generate motion blur for your camera. And fortunately, again, the pop solver generates velocity. If we switch on our display point trails over here on the right hand side of our viewport, you'll notice that all of them have these trails to them, which is really nice because what happens is that is motion, right? That's what you can use for motion blur. We can just take that and tell our renderer to use that to define our motion blur. So let's go ahead and do that at the stage level. We'll look through our camera 
We'll play this back a little. And as you can see, no motion blur. If we go to our camera render settings and we go over to the camera effects tab, you'll see that there's motion blur. The type of motion blur that we wanna use is velocity blur because we're using it based on an attribute. Oftentimes motion blur will be figured out just by how much an object moves. But if we have an attribute like velocity, we can tell it use the attribute. So let's just use the velocity attribute and you'll see that all of them get blurred. Okay, they don't really look like sparks. So this is where we're gonna to have to start looking at materials. Let's go ahead and drop a material library. Over here, we can drop a material library and after our sub import, we can plug it in over there. This material library allows us to just create some materials. It's like a material network, but we're now putting it in the stage level. So over here, double click on your material network, go ahead and drop a principled shader, and we can just call this sparks. What we're going to do is we're not going to use an albedo multiplier. So we don't actually want a base color. What we actually want is an emission color. So we can go down to the bottom, set our emission intensity to one, and then we can tell it to use the point color, right? Now, what this does is the same thing as when we use point color on our base color, right? So it's just using that CD attribute, but now it's using it for emission. So our emission intensity is one and the color of our emission is whatever the point color is, CD. To assign that, all we have to do is auto full materials and then assign them to some geometry. So the geometry that we want to assign it to is whatever's being brought in by the SOP import. Okay, so what are our sparks called? Let's go ahead and switch to the Solaris viewport so that we have access to this in the bottom left over here, so our scene graph. And over here, you'll see that we have render, cameras, materials, and SOP import one. SOP import one is actually what our particles are called at the moment. You can see if we select them, they get highlighted. If we hide them, they disappear. The reason it's called SOP import one is because when we import using a SOP import node, it names whatever we're bringing in $OS. $OS is a piece of code, similar to $hip that we spoke about not so long ago, where $hip is where your file is saved. $OS represents the name of this node, right? So whatever node you use $OS on, it'll fetch the name of the node. So all it's doing is it's fetching the name of SOP import one and using it for our import path prefix. So if we change this name to Sparks, you'll notice that the name in our scene graph view changes to Sparks as well. So now in our material library, all we have to do is save forward slash sparks. Okay, cool. So let's go ahead and look at it through our camera again, switch on our viewport, switch to our karma view. And just like that, we now have some sparks. The other thing that I'm going to do over here is just add a ground plane, right? We want these to kind of reflect off of something. So let's go ahead and add a grid. And you can also create this at the SOP level, right? You don't have to be creating it at the stage level, but it's easy. So I'm just gonna do it over here. We're gonna merge it in just like this. And once again, notice on this node that it uses $OS. If I set my display flag over here, you'll see grid one. If I change it to something like ground, it'll change over there. This is extremely useful to avoid naming conflicts because by default, when you have multiple nodes like this, they can't have the same name. So let's make sure that we don't have any conflicts of name. That's why $OS is such a useful thing to use. Um, it might seem like kind of silly if you haven't used Udini before, you're like, why is it using this weird piece of code to generate names? That's why. It's because you can have multiple different nodes, but never a conflicting name. So it's always perfect for referencing. Okay, cool. So we're going to merge that in over there. And on our material library, we can dive inside, drop another principal shader. This one, we can just call ground. And what we'll do with this one is we'll just set its base color to black and we'll drop its roughness to about 0.1. Okay, if we go up a level on our material library, we can auto fill that material. Once again, we can say forward slash ground. That's where we want it assigned. Perfect. Now, switch to our karma render settings and look at that, right? We have our particles reflecting off the ground and we can actually hide the background or make it dark so that we can see what we have a little bit more clearly. And as you can see, we now have a pretty nice looking effect. We have these particles that are falling from the sky and they're kind of hitting the ground and splashing and it looks pretty nice. Um, what I would do is maybe decrease the size of these so we can go back up to the object level, into our sparks, and over here, we can just reduce this, right? So this P scale of 0.01, let's just reduce that to 0.05. So half the size it was, back to stage. That looks pretty good. And so, we can adjust our camera slightly so that the angle is nicer. And 
And if you happen to have some clipping on your camera, like you do over here, where an object is too close to your camera, so it's getting cut off, you can go to the view tab. And over here, we have a clipping range, right? So this is the near clipping and that's the far clipping. So if we reduce the clipping range for near to zero, you won't have any of that clipping anymore. Okay, so over on the sampling tab, we have some other options that are kind of interesting. We have focus distance. Focus distance we can use for adding shallow depth of field, which would be really nice for something like this. So let's skip a little bit ahead. This is currently not blurred by depth of field. And we can view this if we just disable our motion blur, just so that we can see them as just these particles. Let's try and work with our depth of field. So for depth of field to work, you have to activate your f-stop, right? So f-stop of, let's do 1.4. That's pretty shallow, right? So you're going to end up with this really nice bouquet effect where everything is getting blurred. However, we want to adjust where our focal point is. Currently, it's 4.2 meters away. So to adjust it, we can go over to our camera, switch to the transform handles, right? So once you have your transform handles selected, shift plus F will toggle the focal plane. So you can now adjust the focal plane. If you press shift F again, it'll now make it opaque so that you can see exactly where it is. And then shift plus click for wherever you want it to be placed. So if you want it placed over here, you can see how that looks. And then shift F to switch that off. That's pretty good. We can adjust our f-stop. Cool. So just so you know how this works, the lower your f-stop, the more blurring you get. But if your f-stop is zero, it treats it as if it's deactivated. So an f-stop of like 0 0.1 is super, super low and everything gets really blurry. An f-stop of like 10, you won't notice much blurring at all. An f-stop of like 2.3 is generally a pretty good range. So that looks pretty nice. And then all we have to do is switch our motion blur back on, just like that, and switch our display flag. And then we have it. We have particles that now have motion blur. We have depth of field. We have everything, right? So we can have this nice little spark effect going. And you can play around with this. So what I'm going to do on my side is just make a few minor adjustments, tweak it a little bit until I'm happy with the effect. And then what I'll do is I'll render it out and make a few adjustments with some post-processing maybe in some compositing software, and then I'll have it put up over here for you so you can see what it looks like when it's done. And you can end up with the exact same result with what you have over here as what you're seeing over here. So I hope that this was helpful. And just a quick refresher, if you want to render it yourself, go over to this last node over here. You can say render specified frame range, and you can set the range that you want to render. And this is defined by the length of your timeline. So if you change this final value over here to something like 120, you'll notice that it changes to 120 over there. So it's just clipping to the actual full length of your timeline. And so this can be whatever range you want, right? 96, 140, whatever. And it'll change the value over there and render that number of frames. Once you're happy with it, you can just say render to disk. It'll all be rendered to disk based on the path given by the comma settings. So over here, your output picture, dollar hip, that's where this file is saved in a folder that it creates called render, forward slash, the name of this file, dot, the name of this node, dot, the frame number, dot, exr. <laughs> so that will render out the full sequence for you if you'd like to. Right, so if you need a refresher on how to render, remember just to check out the previous rendering parts that we did. That should answer any questions that you may have. Um, if there's anything that I didn't answer in this tutorial series thus far, feel free to leave a comment um, I'll be as active as I can in the comments. Just if you have any questions at all, leave it in the comments. I'll get to them. But that's it. That brings us to the end of this part. Feel free to play around with this. You can like, change the color of the sparks. You can change camera angles. You can change the thing that it's falling on. You can change your emitter. You can change what it's impacting, right? You don't have to use a ground plane. If you want to do something cool, you can use like a static collider. Um, mess around with those things, right? Use some other knowledge that you may have to add to this and feel free to tag me on Instagram. That would be at nine underscore between. Um, and I'll check out all of you guys work over there. But yeah, if you enjoyed this, um, please remember to like, subscribe, and maybe join if you really like this. It really helps us out. So thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye.